Namaste everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for another session of Yoga Insights. Um, so today's session, we're going to feature Dr. Surisha Putluri, who is a medical doctor and a dietary and lifestyle medical coach who is certified in plant-based nutrition through eCornell. She's certified in lifestyle medicine. She's also a certified lifestyle medicine physician, and her interest is in plant-based nutrition and disease prevention and reversal. Um, she hosts plant-based workshops, diabetes undone workshops, and also does one-on-one -on -one consultations for weight loss and disease reversal. She has been featured on numerous shows and podcasts, including Jane Unchained, News Network, Chef AJ, Gift of Health in New York, and et cetera. Um, she's also very passionate about crafting whole food plant-based recipes, which she constantly updates on her blog, Plant-Based Los Angeles. So today, uh, today's session, Dr. Sarisha is going to talk to us about plant, about a plant-based diet and lifestyle for wellness. And as yoga practitioners, nutrition is so important to us. So I think this is a great topic. So let's uh, welcome Dr. Potluri. Would you like to join us, please? Yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. Namaste, everyone. Namaste. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Sophia, and all the viewers, whoever uh, is attending. And thank you, Indika Yoga, for giving me this opportunity. And um, as uh, Sophia said, I'm very passionate about talking uh, about, namast uh, about lifestyle medicine and plant-based diet. Um, this is much needed um, in this current situation, especially when the COVID hit, then everyone um, just jumped and said, what's going on? Why are these pandemics coming? And why people are um, responding in the way they're responding? So then it showed like how unhealthy our um, how unhealthy of a diet and lifestyle is, right? So I want to uh, share a presentation is, yeah. Sophia, I'm gonna share a presentation, okay? So as Sophia mentioned, this is my, uh, blog plantbasedlosangeles.org and uh, Facebook and my Instagram is under my name city underscore health foods and um, I, I believe in this principle of uh, let food be medicine and medicine be food of course we need uh, the modern day medicine the traditional modern day medicine for acute conditions but for chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, arthritis, um, and then some inflammatory conditions, we can use nutrition and lifestyle. And to be specific, plant-based nutrition is, is the one that helps with all these chronic diseases. So why are we here today? Why are we talking about this? Um, the reason is like, um, this message, especially the importance of nutrition, uh, the importance of lifestyle is not being shared by many doctors and healthcare professionals in their traditional practice. Um, as, as a doctor, the first duty is to educate the patient not to take the medicine, right? We, why are we doing yoga? Why are we uh, working out? Why are we eating more fruits? Why are we eating more vegetables? Because we want to be healthy. Why, why we all want to be healthy? We don't want to take medicine. We don't want to stay in the hospital, right? And we want to feel our best. So, so that's the reason I'm doing this uh, presentation today so that I can shed some light on the importance of nutrition and lifestyle changes. So as I mentioned, um, father of modern medicine, William Osler said, one of the first duties of physician is to educate people not to take medicine. So I believe this in this principle, um, but as I mentioned in the beginning, of course, for acute conditions, for accidents, for fever, for some infections, we definitely need doctors. Doctors are the the people who work so hard to help the people to get rid of the diseases. So what I'm trying to say here is 
doctors should be educated about nutrition and lifestyle changes too. So along with doing the traditional uh, pills and surgeries, if they can educate the patients about the plant-based nutrition, it will be so good for everyone. So, sorry. So, so, so here comes the diet and lifestyle. I really uh, wanted to show this slide because when COVID hit, then we all jumped and said like, oh, what's happening? So especially people who are obese, who have heart disease, who have diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and asthma suffered the most when COVID-19 hit. Not that other people didn't suffer, but the, the research says people who are not healthy in general, who have high, higher body mass index, who have underlying chronic diseases suffered the most. And all these, all these diseases, all these chronic diseases have a connection to diet and lifestyle. I'm not saying uh, genetics won't play, play, uh, play a role. Genetics plays a role, but then in the genetics, you know, that there is a saying the, the, in, when we have a gun, the genes only will load the gun. Uh, our daily habits, our nutrition, our lifestyle will trigger, trigger the gun. So for that reason, diet and lifestyle is extremely important. And let's see what it is. So today's presentation, we are not paid by anyone. Uh, I'm not doing this presentation uh, for any financial compensation. I'm doing it for the health of our community. So I like, I like this uh, infographic, take one a day with tomato and cucumber. So the P here is replaced by F, which, which is like the, the things we get in farm. So. So, and also uh, one more important thing is whatever you hear in this presentation is not a substitute for the advice you get from your medical provider. Okay, talk with your medical provider before making significant dietary changes. So that's very important. This presentation is only for educational purposes. Okay. So this presentation is only for the educational purposes. And this is how the, the current uh, community is, like the current status is. We see a big, big line where there is pills and surgery and we don't see even a single person at the lifestyle change. But I think the situation is changing. We see more people exercising now. We see more people liking to eat more fruits and vegetables. And we see a lot of people practicing yoga, which is one of the best things we can do for our health, right? So um, pills and surgery are necessary, but not always. Whenever we get an ailment, first we have to try the lifestyle change. We have to try it for a few months or few years and see like if the lifestyle change is helping. If that is not helping, we have amazing doctors who's gonna help us with pills and surgery as well. And if we can combine these two, we won't, we won't have such big lines in front of hospitals, right? That the whole, the whole idea of, of medicine is not to have such big lines at the hospitals, not to build huge hospitals. When we are building huge hospitals all around the country, that means we are, we are unhealthy. What are the hospitals doing? Like they're, they're just giving more pills, more pills. Did anyone ever reverse the disease just because there are more doctors? Did anyone reverse the disease just because more hospitals are being built? No, unfortunately, no. So let's all, you know, try to make the lifestyle changes um, and the diet changes and make the plant-based diet a lifestyle change instead of doing dieting for a few days and thinking, oh, I don't want to stay on the diet and then getting back to the weight. Instead of doing that yo-yoing, if we can make the diet itself a lifestyle change, then it can be sustainable. So this is the infographic from American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So uh, they 
came up with six pillars of lifestyle medicine. So six pillars that we have to focus and that's going to help us for betterment of our health, nutrition, exercise, avoiding substance abuse, um, learning techniques, how to, um, you know, efficiently overcome the stress. So we cannot say, I don't want stress in my life. Stress is inevitable. We all have stress, small, big, even, even small kids have stress. So we have to, we have to develop techniques, how to manage the stress. And um, I'm sure the, or, the organization um, knows how to deal with the stress because you are all into yoga and meditation. That's the best thing we can do for, you know, managing our stress and reducing our stress. And then sleep, sleep, no one talks about sleep. We all know sleep is the most important thing um, with the invention of electricity. Um, we all lost sleep, right? Like when you look at the nature, when you look at the animals, as soon as the, the sun goes down and it gets dark, the animals sleep. They don't have phones. They don't have TVs. They don't have iPads. So, so they are in sync with the nature. They, they follow the circadian rhythm. So sleep is non-negotiable and one of the most important pillar and relationships, having positive relationships, having, um, you know, meaningful relationships, either it be husband, wife, kids, friends, co-workers, parents, relatives, you know, as much as possible, trying to maintain positive relationships is the best thing we can do for our health. You know, you can do all these things. You can eat the best diet possible. You can do yoga every day. But if you're always angry with your spouse, you're not healthy, right? So having positive relationships is very, very important. So these are the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. And there is no doubt that nutrition takes the center stage. So that's why we call food as medicine. So let's see that. Um, so this is again, you know, uh, how to improve immunity um, by managing stress, not smoking, improving quality sleep, healthy eating, and we'll come more into healthy eating of course, activity and connectivity. So there is a research that has been done, like people who talk, uh, especially during COVID times, who talked with their friends often on phone were much healthier than people who did not have, you know, connectivity with their friends. So, so it's that important to stay connected and especially having positive relationships. And talking about sleep, once we... Uh, finish off talking about sleep. Um, I'll come to plant-based nutrition and what is plant-based diet and everything. Um, especially youngsters, they are losing sleep. They are, they are, they're thinking like, you know, sleep is not important. There are their phones and social media for like midnight or past one 1 a.m. So it's important to tell our kids and even our generation that sleep is very important because that's when the cleaning happens in our brain. There is a system called glymphatic system that has been, you know, naturally put in our brains. So brain's cleanup system during sleep is so, so important because that helps to regulate our blood glucose levels, regulate the blood pressure numbers. And the less sleep we have, our hunger increases. And less sleep is linked to obesity as well as increased risk of Alzheimer's and decreased immunity. So sleep is very, very important. And now let me talk about the plant-based diet. So vegetarian is different from vegan. Vegan is different from plant-based. So we, you all know what is vegetarian, right? So vegetarian is, um, it has dairy, but no uh, animal products like uh, flesh, but uh, we have dairy. In vegan, 
um it's it's like it's like a lifestyle change we don't eat any animal products we don't consume dairy and then we don't even use any animal products or cause harm to any animals very empathetic towards animals and plant based is again a little different from vegan predominantly plant based like majority of their food comes from plants um and uh, sometimes vegan can be unhealthy and whole food plant based is the healthiest i'll i'll come to that so what does vegan means like right? we we hear this word a lot so it's it's like a lifestyle veganism is a way of living um where we we try to avoid animal exploitation in every aspect either it be handbags or footwear or clothing or the 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 seat covers we use in our cars all of those um exclude the animal product so veganism is very very evolved and i would say the ultimate ahimsa um so i have so much respect for vegans because they they care for uh, the souls that reside even in animals so there is no animal product used either in the food or the products they use so one might think like what's wrong with dairy um so i'll 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 tell you like sorry what happens is dairy in dairy is like even when we eat dairy there is we are we are we are taking the opportunity of the baby cow eating um, drinking the mother's milk and we are we are taking that milk instead of the mother traditionally when like 60 years back everyone used to have a cow in their backyard and the baby cow used to drink and the leftover the family used to use that's a whole different story but now when you look at the dairy industry it's scary if anyone goes into commercial dairy um you know where where they raise the dairy animals and what happens to them um it's it's horrific so i don't want to go there but i want to talk about whole food plant based diet so whole food plant based diet is nothing but it's anything that comes from plants that is minimally processed you know as much as possible fruits are the best example of the minimally processed food we can take similarly vegetables i mean we cook the vegetables that fine because many vegetables retain their nutritional value even after cooking as a matter of fact some of the vegetables are more nutritious when we cook them than when they are raw like tomatoes and carrots they are more nutritious when we cook that vegetable so and when it comes to legumes which is nothing but chenna rajma and then all the lentils black eyed peas um and then um moong dal all these come under legumes and i would say the legumes are like the super food they're filled with fiber they're filled with antioxidants and they're so good um for diabetes as well as controlling the heart rate and everything and then millets um it can be any whole grain it can be millets it can be brown rice it can be quinoa or quinoa um you know it can be amaranth all these whole grains that are minimally processed here you see steel cut oats you know these are minimally processed oats oat groats is one more minimally processed oats so even the whole grain breads that we get in the market are not truly whole grain so one brand called ezekiel is is the best as far as we have seen but if someone you know is capable of making their own bread with all the fiber in and no oil that's also best and corn tortillas are also fine because they grind the corn and make the tortillas right so whole food plant based diet is basically fruits vegetables legumes millets and minimally processed whole grains and of course seeds and nuts seeds and nuts are also very important part and 
spices like turmeric, cumin seeds, black cumin seeds that we call kalonji, and then methi, uh, methi seeds and um, dania. These are all we uh, are blessed with all these spices, especially Indian cooking. We're so lucky that we know how to make all these amazing vegetables and legumes and grains into delicious food, which can be healthy for us. Even in the, in the plant-based diet, there are so many um, different, um, you know, ideas. Like when we go into the depth, a uh, whole food plant based no oil whole food plant based minimal oil so things like that so especially when someone wants to reverse their disease someone wants to reduce their cholesterol reduce the hemoglobin a1c and um, have better control of their blood pressures and uh, um, you know get rid of their arthritis pain going oil free is really really helpful so when we say whole food plant-based no oil, this is the acronym. Um, that means we don't add oil while cooking. So all, all the recipes on my blog are oil-free recipes. But uh, when I do the workshops, I'm very flexible because for everyone, it's not possible to go oil-free. So if you're using a tablespoon of oil, cutting down to half teaspoon is a big win. There itself, you're cutting down the calories. There itself, you're cutting down the fat, thereby improving the chronic disease. So one diet um, I always recommend everyone to avoid is keto. Um, it, it gained popularity for wrong reasons. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in the next coming upcoming slides, but I'll, I'll tell you why it gained um, popularity for wrong reasons. Because um, when, when we eat keto diet, we are not getting enough fiber. We are not getting enough antioxidants. We are not getting enough, um, you know, uh, quality nutrients that we need and on top of it the excess protein the excess calcium the excess iron we get from keto diet can damage our heart um, not many people know iron overload is one of the worst things for heart so when you go to a cardiologist they often order ferritin levels the higher the serum ferritin levels the it's it's the higher risk of heart disease they put such patients on clopidogrel or other blood thinners right so we have to be careful the keto diet it it only has role in very rare seizures um, as well as some forms of cancer but a recent meta analysis have shown that keto diet has increased mortality and, and I, I often hear this in, with, with the patients as well as my workshop participants, like, oh, anyhow, I'll get diabetes, anyhow, I'll get blood pressure because it runs in my family. So unfortunately, um, this is a common, common conception. But um, as I said, genetics loads the gun and lifestyle pulls the trigger. This is an amazing quote. We don't know who said this, but we often use this and it's very true because genetics has only two to 20% role. Um, and there are some diseases like Huntington's chorea, where we get uh, involuntary moments. That is a genetic disease where no one can do anything. But I'm talking about chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, arthritis, other, you know, autoimmune diseases, things like that. We can, you know, make lifestyle and dietary choices and change it because 80 to 98 percent of um, the chronic disease risk is is based upon our lifestyle and dietary changes. And this is an excellent, excellent app where you can download the app for free. It's uh, Dr. Michael Greger's Daily Dozen. Um, it gives us, you know, all the things we need for the entire day. We can check box 
And it also gives us what vitamins we need to take. Vitamin B12 and vitamin D is often the vitamins I recommend for someone going on a plant-based diet and recommended by all plant-based physicians. Um, and here he, he mentions the serving sizes also. For example, beans, three servings per day, and each serving is just half cup of cooked beans. So three times a day, if we are taking three half cups of chana, you, we got enough beans for that day. And beans are brilliant, I should say, because they are excellent in controlling our blood sugars as well as controlling our heart rate. And they feed our gut microbiome. So if there are any health professionals in the, in, the, uh, in the participants, you know what microbiome is. And many of the um, health enthusiasts now know what is gut microbiome. So the healthier gut microbiome we have, the less risk of chronic disease. So beans are the best for increasing the health of our microbiome. So similarly, fruits, greens, berries, cruciferous vegetables, for example, cauliflower, kale, broccoli, um, you know, radishes and mustard, all these come under cruciferous vegetables and other vegetables, flax seeds, grains, the whole grains, as well as spices, beverages. And he even gives the, the serving sizes of exercise, how much exercise we need to do. So it's a free app. Anyone can download it. And please um, download and use it. And in this presentation, I wanted to talk about the blue zones. Um, these are the longest living people. Um, when I say longest living people, it's not just living long, but living long healthy. So there is lifespan, there is health span. So many of us see like people on the beds living long but their health span is short, right? So we want health span to be improved, not the lifespan. So all these blue zones, for example, Okinawa, Japan, Ikaria, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, and Costa Rica, and Loma Linda, California, uh, all these are blue zones because uh, there we have longest living healthy people. So what are they doing when we research them? Um, who did the research? He's Dan Butner. He's, he did research on blue zones. So when, when they did the research, what they found is they eat mostly plants. So they don't eat, you know, uh, animal products. They mostly eat plants. They don't overeat um, especially in Okinawa, Japan, they have like a philosophy. Haribuchibu is like, it's like eat only until you're 80% full. Don't eat until you're 100% full. So all of these people have a purpose. So, and then they maintain close relationships. They control stress. They do yoga. They do, um, you know, exercise. They do meditations. They do uh, stress relieving techniques, whichever it is, talking with your friends, um, you know, connecting with your family. All this can be stress relieving things and they stay moving. They don't go to gyms. They don't go to um, exercise classes, but they do yoga at their home naturally. They walk up hills because they're all working working in the fields, they're working in the farms. So that is what they found out in the blue zones. And the common thing out of all the blue zones we talked is family more important for them. There is no smoking, plant-based diet is predominant, constant moderate physical activity. They don't sit for too long. You know, sitting is um, it's, I mean, people get offended when we say this, but sitting is the new smoking. So the longer you sit, it's, it's like you're smoking, your, your health is damaged as if you're smoking. So constantly sitting can be detrimental for heart health. So 
uh, here in blue zones, they have constant moderate physical activity. They're always moving. They're always doing something, going places, going hiking, going into the fields and working or going walking to the relative's home and talking and coming back. So there is social engagement as well. And even in the plant-based diet, the, the one thing they found is legumes. So all of them are using a lot of beans, either it can be soybeans or it can be white beans that they use or fava beans, you know. So whatever it is, they're, they're using a lot of legumes, you know, uh, like chenna, rajma, uh, black eyed peas, uh, lentils and all these dals. In, in, in India, we call them dals, right? So all those things. That is about blue zones. And one, one more thing is like, we always talk about protein, 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 but in Okinawa, 70% of the carbs they eat come from sweet potatoes. So they eat a lot of sweet potato. They, they still have little bit of meat, egg and dairy and fish, but very little. When you see just maybe 1%, 1 person fish, 1 person dairy, 1 person egg, and a little bit of meat and flavorings and a little bit of alcohol. So majority of their food is plant-based. That too, they have a lot of sweet potatoes. And whenever we talk about calcium, um, I mean, about plant-based diet, immediately people think like, oh, if I don't drink milk, if I don't eat cheese, if I don't eat paneer, where do I get my calcium? Where is this big bison getting his, uh, his calcium from, right? So uh, we, these animals and the milk is only the middleman because the calcium is abundant in plants, the leafy greens, the whole grains, the lentils, the beans, the seeds, sesame seeds are loaded with calcium. Moringa has so much calcium. You, you all know Moringa, right? The drumstick leaves, it's loaded with calcium. Curry leaves have calcium. Like all the greens and vegetables we use have little bit of calcium, but some of the leafy greens have a lot more calcium. Some of the whole grains have a lot more calcium, as well as the beans and, you know, seeds have a lot of calcium. Uh, yeah. And then I wanted to show this. This is from Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine um, to show how, like, the risk of cancer has been increasing year by year. Uh, here, when you see in the bottom of this infographic, healthful lifestyle and then Western diet. So, so the more, the more you know, healthful lifestyle we have, the cancer risk is decreasing. And when we look at the breast cancer risk, the breast cancer risk is increasing just with two glasses of milk. Sorry, this is prostate cancer. The prostate cancer risk is increasing just with two glasses of milk. You know, so um, especially in US, African American men drink a lot of milk and genetically also they're, they're you know, a little bit uh, prone for prostate cancer. So the cancer risk is increasing because of milk consumption. And the more dairy protein we are taking, for example, from cheese or paneer, the prostate cancer risk is increasing. And calcium supplement can also increase the risk of cancer. And again, with the colorectal cancer, which is nothing but colon cancer, the more red meat and alcohol we take, the colon cancer risk increases. But when we are you know, eating cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, um, you know, mustard greens like sarsom, and then all, all the healthy vegetables, our cancer risk is decreasing by 18%. Similarly, with high intake of fruits, carotenoid veggies, natural soy foods decrease the breast cancer risk. So gastric cancer risk has increased 200% with the Western diet. So this is all real data. And when you go to Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which is PCRM, we, we have all this information. So again, um, we talked about calcium. Now, again, let's talk about protein. So 
we are i i think the whole world is obsessed with protein so everyone asks like oh when someone becomes a vegetarian or vegan or plant based the first thing they ask is oh how do you get your protein so where these all these big animals getting their protein from there is abundant protein in plants you know the legumes are like the best source of protein and i'll tell you why legumes are the best source of protein so here, when you compare the plant protein versus animal protein, um, for, for, for first I want to uh, mention like how much protein do we need? We all are getting excess protein than we need. An average adult male needs just 56 grams of protein. So after 50, our protein needs increase a little bit, but until 50 years old, an average male will need 56 grams of protein. An average female needs 46 grams of protein. But many of us are getting 80 grams of protein per day, far more than is necessary. What will happen to the excess protein? It's stored as fat and can lead to weight gain and prevent weight loss, right? So our bodies benefit from eating fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, and it has all the combination of carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And the most important ingredient is plant protein comes protected with all the antioxidants and fiber. The most important thing is fiber because when you eat animal protein, there is zero fiber. Any animal product, has no fiber, zero fiber. And fiber is the most important thing. As I talked before, fiber protects our gut microbiome. Fiber helps you know, reduce our chronic disease risk. Fiber can help regulate the blood sugars. And where is fiber? Every plant has fiber. Some plants have more fiber than others. For example, peas, legumes, Black beans, all of these have a lot of fiber. Red lentils, they all have a lot of fiber. What is uh, the, the number given here is protein. For example, when you see the red lentils, one cup of red lentils has 18 grams of protein. So you're all just with one cup of lentils, you're getting, you know, almost, almost half of the protein or, you know, we need for the day. So if you eat red lentils with some vegetables, you're getting easily half of the protein because we always mix lentils with spinach and make spinach dal and all that, right? So, so think like we are getting protein, but the added advantage of plant protein is fiber, phytonutrients, vitamins, minerals, and it has no cholesterol and very low fat right? When compared to animal protein, the animal protein, one cooked egg is six grams, salmon, three uh, ounce of cooked is 20 grams. But the thing is, and, and then the chicken for three ounce is like 25 grams of protein. But the problem here is we are getting cholesterol, we are getting saturated fat, there is no fiber, and animal protein is higher in calories, and it has no antioxidants, no phytonutrients, no vitamins or minerals. There are some vitamins, but we can get all those vitamins from plant protein, right? So, so this is a very important infographic um, because plant protein is abundant in fiber and phytonutrients. Animal protein has zero fiber. So yeah, this is Canada, Canada Food Guide. They, they are very clever. They are very advanced. And they changed their food guide in 2019. And when you see the plate here, um, half of the plate is filled with fruits and vegetables. In the other half, uh, one four, I mean, in the other half, the half is filled with whole grains. So they're recommending to choose whole grains. And even in the protein foods, they included a lot of plant protein. There's still, there is still a lit, little bit of animal protein, but mostly plants. And uh, the best thing is milk is not the drink of choice. Unfortunately, in... Um, 
American uh, food guide, milk is still the drink of choice. Here, water is drink of choice. So this is an amazing, amazing food plate and eating 75%, at least 75% of your plate filled with fiber can bring, you know, such good health, can help, you know, reverse or even uh, uh, reduce or even reverse chronic diseases. And we all think like, oh, if, if plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine can help us, why are doctors not talking about it? right? In 1950s, these are the advertisements that happened in 1950s. You know, doctors used to advertise saying like, oh, uh, drink, uh, you know, smoke camel cigarettes, they, they are better for you. And there are other doctors who say, oh, um, you know, some other uh, brand is better than camel. So doctors used to advertise to smoke cigarettes. So now, the processed food, the standard American diet is equivalent to this. If a doctor asks you to do keto, that means he's still in this era, right? He's still in this era of telling you to smoke cigarette. So let's not wait until the Surgeon General tells us not to uh, eat any animal product or reduce the animal product. So before that, we can change and we can eat more plants and improve our health. So I, there is a lot, but uh, with the time constraint, I'm going to stop here and uh, we'll see if there are any questions. Hi, Sophia. Hi, hi. That was that was so interesting. And there was so much knowledge in that presentation. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, I have a lot of friends who are a little obsessed with the keto diet. It's it's like a fad in Bombay right now, especially. So I'm definitely going to share this with them. It's it's important because, you know, a lot of us follow these fad diets without really knowing what we're doing. Yes. And, I mean, it's like you said, as Indians, we're so lucky. We already have such a beautiful nutritional system of food. If we just eat what our mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers taught us to eat, none of these problems would happen. In fact, I think in India right now, there's sort of a westernization of food. You know, because we've become so aspirational. So it was so fantastic listening to you talk about these issues and uh, to be able to also say, because we're also living in this age of extreme political correctness, where everyone just wants to be positive about everything, you know, even if it's harmful. So thank you for so honestly sharing with us. And we do have a few questions. So let's sure. start with uh, Anupamji, who's saying during summer, all type of plants are easily not available. So can you please suggest an appropriate diet for the same duration and also maybe the monsoon season, if, if I may add to that? Yeah, I, I totally understand uh, the seasonal restrictions that happen, but whatever is available locally, whatever is available seasonally, try to use that. Or um, I would say like we all fear freezing our free fruits and vegetables. Um, there was a question in the Q&A about freezing the vegetables. Um, when the fruits and vegetables are available freshly, there is nothing wrong in freezing the vegetables and fruits because freezing the fruits and vegetables will retain the nutrients whenever possible, use it fresh, but get the fruits and vegetables that are not available in the season. And if you have, uh, you know, good quality freezers or refrigerators, try to freeze them. That way you can have the supply year long. And it's a myth that, uh, frozen uh, vegetables are bad. As a matter of fact, when they freeze the vegetables in the big facilities, they, they use the freshest fruits and vegetables. As soon as they cut the crop, within hours, they do the washing and freeze it. So it's fresh than what we use when we buy the fresh vegetables. Again, depends on the quality of the freezing that happens in the supermarket. So I would say the best thing is to buy it yourself fresh, 
then freeze in your freezer. That way, you know, like if there is electricity, if there was like, you know, enough uh, freezing done or not. Hope that answers. Yes, thank you so much. Um, then Hari Sharma ji is asking, what's your recommendation for an anti-inflammation diet? So anti-inflammatory food, I guess. Okay, um, excellent question. Plant-based diet is the best for reducing inflammation. But again, we are blessed with this amazing spices, turmeric, ginger, and all the spices that are available in our spice box, the traditional spice dabba. I, I wish I bought that here in the presentation. I, I say like that's the medicine box for us. The mustard seeds um, and the turmeric, uh, the cumin seeds, as well as the ginger, all of this will reduce inflammation. But whenever we're eating low fat plant-based diet, our inflammation reduces. So in my workshops, when I teach um, the oil-free cooking and introduce like how to do oil-free cooking, after a few weeks, I get the feedback saying like their joint pains have reduced because believe it or not, even if you don't see the weight loss immediately, there are like positive side effects, like the under eye circles gone, or they have better sleep or their arthritis pain have reduced. That's what we hear from the participants. So reducing the oil, will reduce the inflammation as well as adding um, ginger and turmeric and other spices regularly to our diet is so, so helpful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we've got uh, quite a, suddenly a couple of questions. Aditi ji is asking, uh, does food also retain nutrition if you freeze cooked food? Uh, because it's, uh, she faces various challenges in preparing fresh food daily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Regarding the cooked food, I, I, I still have to do a lot of research on that, but not more than a week or 10 days, you know? Um, but but again, it depends on the situation. If you have healthy cooked food frozen available and then you have unhealthy fresh food available, I would go and pick healthy cooked frozen food. So it depends on the situation. So for example, today I made palak with chana you know, and I know like I won't be eating for a couple of days, like maybe three days. So I freeze it in the, uh, in the freezer and I would eat that than, you know, some other unhealthy food. So for week, 10 days, it's fine to freeze the food. We, we do that all the time. Great. Um, thank you. I hope that answers your question. And it's very good advice, actually, because I keep thinking about the same thing as well. Um, then we have Anupam ji who's asking, uh, yes, I think a lot of um, us Indians would also like to know is one, what is the best plants for calcium intake? And also, is it okay to include sweets in our diet? Yes, of course. <laughs> it's okay to include sweets, but making healthy sweets. I'll answer the calcium question too, but sweets is always tempting, right? So I'll answer that question first. So um, we make sweets using dates, beetroot, carrot, and then uh, lauki and uh, whole grains, millet. So you can make millet paisam or what do you say in... Um, in Hindi, um, what is payasam called? Kheer. Uh, we can make millet kheer. We can make carrot halwa. We can make beetroot halwa. That the idea of, of making sweets is using fruits or vegetables as well as a little bit of nuts and using dates as the sweetener. That way, even if you eat sweet, you're eating the whole food, right? There is no processing that's being happening, right? So, so of course, we eat sweet, like for every festival, either it's Ramanavami or, um, you know, uh, Sankranti or Ugadi or whatever big festivals we celebrate. I do prashad for uh, Shwami and then we offer, but 
it's all whole food plant based and there is no dairy products we can always substitute dairy milk with almond milk with cashew milk with you know soy milk so it's with with the modernization it has become so easy for um, the plant based milks to available even in a small city i am here in india i came for vacation in a small city i am here in india i was surprised to see unsweetened soy milk in the stores i was so happy so immediately we made yogurt with the yo- with that and it tastes so good <laughs> Yes, that's and also coconut milk, which is again such a traditional. Uh, or is that, or would you not recommend coconut milk? Um, I'll answer the coconut milk, and then I'll come to calcium. I don't want to forget, so I'm mentioning okay. it. So, so regarding the coconut milk, um, you know, I'm I'm not um, so keen on using coconut milk because it is very high in saturated fat, actually. um uh, apart from animal foods one one uh, food which is very high in saturated fat is coconut 82% of coconut oil is saturated fat so it's and um when you do the research kerala or the the part of india where they use coconut have the highest heart disease they the large number of stunts are being done in that part of the country the reason is coconut um uh, if you use freshly grated coconut sparsely like in little quantities it's fine but uh, for someone with um with uh, heart disease or with increased cholesterol i would say stay away from coconut that way you can uh, reduce the risk um but occasionally to make desserts it's okay to use coconut milk yeah occasionally yeah and coming back to calcium uh, there are a lot of seeds um and nuts that are high in calcium uh, particularly sesame seeds are very high in calcium as well as uh, um beans chenna rajma uh black eye peas they are all very high in calcium as well as greens almost all of the green leafy vegetables are loaded with calcium um uh, amaranth um uh, we cook with amaranth greens we cook with mustard greens all those are nicely loaded with calcium as well as whole grains millets and then um you know oats they all have little bit of calcium but we can get enough from green leafy vegetables so when you go and look back at dr michael gregor's uh, daily dozen uh, you see the recommended um, serving of greens so getting greens every day is that important because we don't want to get um, deficient in calcium right and uh, hope that answers the question yes and thank you so much even what you said about coconut cuz i'm in south india right now and it's literally raining coconuts here so it's uh-huh. good to know it's good to know i use coconut oil and i have to rethink that so thank you for that um we have supti ji asking when we do uh, we we just have time for a few more questions guys i'm sorry i don't know if we can answer all of them she's asking when we do strength training do we then need more protein that's a great question so anyone above 65 uh, or above 60 uh, they need little bit more protein as we get older we need little protein as well as when you are act actively doing an exercise it can be strength training or it can be running it can be uh, lifting weights um, this is all those things will break our muscle especially lifting weights as well as strength training so there is little bit increase in protein needs but we don't need protein supplement we can get from our food even if you need um uh you know even if you take protein supplement i would say go for um organic plant based protein but in rare instances i suggest that if you can eat 
food, getting protein from the food is the best way than from the supplements, because you will be getting added fiber, added phytonutrients, added antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, and micronutrients, right? So you're missing all that in the supplement. So yeah, definitely. Like when you, when you are exercising, you can add an extra cup of chenna, because a cup of chenna has 16 grams of protein, which is a lot. So you can design your diet that way. That Thank you so much for asking. I know her. <laughs> okay. Okay. How yeah. wonderful. Um, we were just going to take one last question. And for everyone whose questions we haven't answered, uh, answered, please stick around because there is a way to get them answered later. I'll come to that. The last question we're going to take is from Ramesh Gelly G. Um, again, because this is very important uh, for Indians. What is your view of ghee from A2 cows? Because again, ghee is something we all eat a lot of in India. Yeah, I know it's it's a very sensitive topic because people um, immediately, immediately connect ghee with culture. So um, I don't want to offend anyone, but uh, I want to tell the state the facts. Um, ghee is high in saturated fat. Ghee is high in oxidized cholesterol. Oxidized cholesterol is something that goes and sticks to our endothelium, the inner lining of our arteries, and it damages the endothelium. So ghee was used in Ayurveda as a vehicle to give medicine because many of the Ayurvedic medicines are fat soluble. Okay. So at that time, we didn't have any other commodity or fat available to get the medicine into our system, right? So for that reason, ghee was used as a vehicle to get the medicine in Ayurveda. And when you look at a century back and now the ghee production has increased thousandfold, right? So similarly, the heart disease, the diabetes, the arthritis, the cholesterol, everything have increased. What I say is like, if culturally you're so attached to ghee, adding a drop or two every day in your food is not going to harm you. If rest of the food you're eating is like whole food plant-based. So, but again, if someone is vegan, if someone has that sentiment or philosophy or not taking any animal product, obviously they'll avoid ghee. But other than that, I, um, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, think ghee is a health product. It's, um, it, it was used in Ayurveda as a vehicle to get our medicine inside. So hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. Um, we have a lot of beautiful comments from all our participants. Thank you so much. They've all loved the session. They're saying it was very educational, very amazing. Thank you everybody for joining. We really appreciate your comments. Just mm -hmm. one last question before we leave. What according to you is the best cooking oil then health wise? <laughs> I know I get this question often. I, I don't recommend oil at all. As, as I said, oil-free cooking is the best method of cooking. But if you have to use oil, use olive oil or canola oil or safflower oil, something with polyunsaturated fats, not coconut oil. Please okay. don't use coconut oil. Um, unfortunately, it's gaining popularity for wrong reasons. And uh, coconut oil is one of the highest, uh, uh, highest saturated fat uh, content in it. So when you when you see the coconut oil on on your shelf, you see it solidifies, right? So it it won't it won't be like liquidy. Whenever the weather is little cold or not even cold, even, even in the normal temperature, unless if it is extremely hot, you see the coconut oil solidifying. That itself says something. Um, and there is a lot of research and uh, please don't use coconut oil. Any other oil is fine, which, has, which is high in polyunsaturated fats, you know, sunflower, safflower, um, and sesame, whatever but reduce the oil intake. 
Oil is nothing but pure fat. You know, in order to get one tablespoon of olive oil, we need more than 200 olives. Can we eat 200 olives at a time? <laughs> it's not possible. And tablespoon, we can easily consume. But that, that olives have phytonutrients, you know, fiber, uh, vitamins, micronutrients and all that. When it comes to olive oil, all of that is filtered and just the calories and fat. Maybe trace elements and trace vitamins are there, but not as much as in olives. So, so to answer the question, don't use coconut oil, reduce any oil consumption. Um, and of course, don't cook in ghee. If I say, if I say don't use oil, people immediately start cooking in ghee, which is even worse. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry, everyone, but we can't take any more questions for today. However, can I please ask uh, you, doctor, to share your contact details with us if any of our participants would like to get in touch with you for consultations, to follow your recipes? Yes, definitely. I'm, I'm, can... I'm writing it down in the chat. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes, definitely. It's uh, they can send me an email and I have a Facebook page plant based Los Angeles dot org. Uh, so Sophia, if you have the link, can you please uh, paste it there? Yes, I'm doing that right now. Oh, thank you so much. And I constantly update on my Instagram and there is a workshop coming up uh, July 9th. If anyone wants to sign up, um, you know, you can please uh, that it's on it's on my website or you can send me an email um i have just shared everyone oh. i've just shared uh, dr potluri's uh, blog you will find her contact details there information about her workshops there and all her beautiful oil free recipes over there which now i'm going to start trying after this talk so please refer to the chat guys it's plantbasedlosangeles.org if you have yes. any more questions for her you can also write to us at namaste at indica yoga our email address and as i said all of our sessions are recorded so you can always come back to the session and view this entire uh, session on our youtube channel on the indica yoga website as well as our facebook and social media channels and of course you can always write to us we're always here for you um yes the recording i just said jayaji will be shared and it will be on the indica yoga platform so please refer to it there um, any last words of advice before we say goodbye? Yeah, so I want everyone to stay healthy, happy and uh, do more yoga, eat more plants uh, <laughs> and not only for your health, but for our mother earth and our planet. Um, let's eat more plants that way we can protect our environment, reduce the greenhouse gases and more food will be available for the entire world if we eat more plants instead of animals. And everyone stay happy. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Before we say goodbye, just a few announcements. Next week, we're going to have a beautiful Yoga Insight sessions with a very uh, with an award win uh, winning filmmaker, Akanksha Damini Joshi. So please join us for that. It's gratitude meditation. It's going to be an hour and a half long, but it's beautiful. So I encourage all our participants to join us. Indica Yoga has also launched its first foundation yoga course. Oh, there we go. There's the poster for the gratitude meditation. Can we also have the poster for the foundation course, please? There we go. Our first uh, residential yoga foundation course is going to be held from the 1st of August to the 10th of August at the Ritambara retreat in Bangalore. So please register for that. Details for this are also on our website. And we're also having a beautiful chakra meditation. Uh, I don't know if we have the poster for that, but again, details for that can be found on our website. It will be hosted by Swami Taponidhi from the Bihar School of Yoga and several other such uh, courses. We have a teacher's training for uh, chanting, which is going to be hosted by, or rather taught by Shantala Sri Ramaya. So information for all of our courses and upcoming events can be found on our website. 
Um, on that note, I would like to thank Dr. Sirisha Potlori once more for this beautiful session, this highly educational session. And all our participants, I'll see you next Friday for our next session of there she is. Thank you so much, Doctor, for this lovely session. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I really, really appreciate. Um, please spread the message and please tell your friends and family that eat more plants. <laughs> for sure. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a beautiful weekend and I'll see you next week. Namaste. Dhanyavad. Namaste.